you know, I want to get into sort of more of the applications of it and what you what you found, but the mechanism of action is really interesting because we're sort of still deciphering that, but it works on both the structure and the function of the brain. So it doesn't just change it in the moment. It seems to have lasting changes, which is why, and I think we're still trying to figure out, you know, why, why if you take it once, if you're a heroin addict, that your addiction cravings go away and your withdrawal symptoms don't happen, which is something you, is a physiological response. It's not like they're psychologically suppressing the withdrawal <laughs> symptoms. They just don't have them. Yeah. And that's really fascinating. And I think, you know, for PTSD, you've got the NMDA receptors, which are the sort of uh, excitatory receptors that get calmed down, which get overexcited with uh, trauma. It does affect somehow the, the serotonin system. It affects brain factors like PDNF, which is otherwise known as brain-derived neurotrophic factor that helps stimulate brain growth and connectivity, neurogenesis, neuroplasticity, more brain cells, more connections between brain cells. So they do all these really interesting things that repair the brain, to heal the brain. Even in traumatic brain injury, which is where you get banged on the head from something where you're in a war zone and you get some kind of traumatic brain injury, it seems to work on that too. So it seems to have all these varying effects. And they also sort of inhibit what we call the default mode network, which is what a lot of other psychedelics do. It's sort of the ego and the self-protection part of your brain, which is, you know, makes us feel separate and disconnected. And when that is suppressed, whether you meditate for 40 years or you take psilocybin or LSD, MDMA or Ibogaine, that quiets down quickly and your, your sense of disconnection and separateness is suspended for a moment and it allows you to sort of see how you're actually part of a greater greater whole and that and so I, I kind of would love you to unpack some of the the mechanisms and how they work in these different disease states because it's like it seems like a one size fits all you know you got PTSD you got depression you got anxiety you got trauma you got brain injury can you kind of unpack those for us and talk about you know how they affect across these various pathways in the brain yeah that's a great question um so the other mechanism that that we've thought a lot about um, that's unique to Ibogaine is uh, glial-derived neurotrophic factor, right? So glial-derived neurotrophic factor is a neurotrophic factor that um, that's involved with dopamine um, neuron kind of health, right? And so it upregulates dopamine neuron health. And so there was a study, you know, 20 years ago or something where they took um, mice and they, uh, mice or rats and they uh, trained them to self-administer, uh, meaning that they basically... You know, it's a mouse, you know, rat model of addiction, yeah. you know, where they're drinking alcohol out of a, out of a, uh, a, a tube. And um, if you take a mouse and you do no that. No little rat bartender there? Or the something <laughs> like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they, they pull up to the bar. They'll, they'll drink in, until eventually they die, right? Um, and if you take um, a mouse like that and you give them Ibogaine, you can actually reverse it. They'll stop self-administering alcohol, which is cool. If you take a mouse and you inject glial-derived neurotrophic factor into the ventral tegmental area, which is the dopamine-producing area that's involved with more of the reward system, you can also produce the same effect. They will stop self-administering. Inject just Ibogaine just into that area, you can recapitulate the effect, right? And people have also shown that you can produce this effect by directly stimulating into those areas, right? And so it's probably that at least the anti-addiction mechanism of Ibogaine is that it's restoring dopamine function within that, um, that ventral tegmental area in a way that resets the reward system. The, the the next piece of data that we have, we published in Nature Mental Health, I don't know, a week ago or something, um, which is a really interesting study where people with that in our trial that received Ibogaine um, had uh, had EEG like uh, brainwave tests before, after, and one month after um, they received Ibogaine, and what we saw is this kind of general slowing of all of the the kind of um, different power spectra of the of the EEG, right? So people had a uh, general kind of uh, physiologic slowing of their brain after, and the slowing actually was correlated with the, the strength of the trip, like the amount that they had um, a psychological effect, yeah. but also interestingly, the reduction in PTSD symptoms and the improvement in cognition. And so... 
you know, that's, it's a, it's a first step study, you know, the, it was pretty good, I think, in the sense we got in nature mental, mental health, but, you know, we need to do some more work on this. So I'm not claiming that this is definitive, but it's likely that if you, you have uh, an EEG, you may be able to tune the dose to the physiology of the brain instead of getting a subjective readout, you, you just, you, you yeah. increase the dose. And then that may also allow for you to tune the PTSD effects, which is really cool, right? So you're kind of, you know, flipping. Some people need more, some people need less, and you can tell by the EEG who needs what, and then can upper. That would be the promise, right? That would be, you know, if if it plays out, that would be, and, and we do this already in medicine, as you know, we use biz monitors and anesthesia to, to kind of measure the level of anesthesia, or if somebody is, you know, being fully anesthetized with like propofol, you can actually, um, you can actually burst suppress them. And you, you're, you know, you're using an EEG to help you dose a drug, you know, so that's not a new concept in, in, in neurology. It's just a new concept within kind of psychiatry. Right? right. Right. And so being able to figure that out, I think is useful. Well, that, that, that's the old joke is neurologists pay no attention to the mind and psychiatrists pay no attention to the brain. And here you are, you know, looking at psychiatry through the lens of the brain, not just the mind. Yeah. And, you know, Freud kind of took us down the path of mind-only psychiatry and yeah. talk therapy and psychoanalysis. And it's sort of striking because, you know, you hear, oh, well, yeah, I heard psychoanalysis say, well, you can come to psychoanalysis five days a week for the next 20 years, and then you'll maybe see some improvement. <laughs> and here you're like, well, you can go, you know, to Mexico and do one Ibogaine journey, and, like, that takes care of, like... 20 years of psychotherapy. I mean, it's kind of crazy. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's a lot of work to do to, to kind of totally prove that. I mean, that's what, that's certainly what people will say. That's what Claudio Naranjo said, I think in, in, you know, the Argentinian psychiatrist many, many decades ago, um, about Ibogaine. It's just one of these things where we're going to have to do, do the work. You, you know, do the good work to figure it out. But I think that, the problem in the kind of common theme of what we've been working on, the problem in psychiatry that's kind of out there right now is this problem of things taking too long, to your point. You know, people can have an entire, you know, tragic life problem over the course of the time it would take, you know, for many of our treatments to work. I mean, psychotherapy, psychoanalysis for 10 years is one, just normal oral antidepressants, you know, I mean, we've seen, you know, people start out an oral antidepressant and lose their job by the time it, it starts it to have an effect. Right. right? And, and so you end up being in this situation where we're not really matching, we're not really matching the speed of the illness and the speed of the disability from the illness with the speed of the treatment. If you love that last video, you're going to love the next one. Check it out here.